Hello, and welcome to our webinar on making the best start to your new school year. My name is Peter Davidson, and I'm one of the presenters at this November's first international conference for Montessori school owners, directors, and administrators in Prague. I've been retired recently, but that's after 44 years of being in Montessori, either as a teacher or an administrator. And I've been reflecting upon all those many years of service in Montessori and how it's best to start the school year. What should your priorities be so that you get your school year off to a smooth and productive start? Here's a calendar for Montessori School in Redlands. And you'll notice that the first day of school is the only date on the whole calendar that's circled in red. We kind of see it as a target, don't we? And during the summer, it's almost like we're on a lazy river and just kind of coasting along, doing some planning, hopefully recharging our batteries, finding some renewal. And then as the school year approaches, we see that target getting closer and closer. And eventually, what we can do is aim for that V in the water, which is going to be the safest path through the rapids. Once we've gotten ourselves to that point, though, Sometimes we feel like, okay, now it's time to kick back and relax a little bit and let the teachers take over. Um, and then wait until some kind of problem comes up that we need to react to. But we all know that being reactive is not the most efficient, um, nor is it the most productive. It's much better to be proactive. So what are a few things that you could make as your priorities and some things that you could put in place now and early in the school year to prevent some of those issues from coming up and to build the foundation for understanding and solving them if they do. I'm gonna say it's all about building relationships and this is the time to build them. Beginnings are important and the beginning of the school year is important. Um, beginnings are important for your relationship with new parents, but it's also the beginning of the school year where you reestablish your relationship with all the members of your school community. And I would say there are four relationships to focus on. Staff, obviously, parents, children, and surprisingly, yourself. Let's talk about staff first. This is one of the pictures that we take every year at Montessori and Redlands just before school starts of our whole staff. It's a staff of 60. We take two pictures each year. One is more serious and one is silly. I'll leave it to your imagination to guess which one this is. But look at the optimism and energy of all of these people before the school year starts. What do you think the same picture would look like mm, a month or two into the school year? Depending on what it looks like, it depends on how you, as the leader, start out the school year. You can have a huge influence on things. With staff, it's all about building teams. I'm going to suggest that there are several different kinds of teams to work on building. First, there's building the team within the whole staff. In the United States, we have something called in-service weeks that are usually the week before school starts or maybe two weeks. They're a great time to build the team of the whole staff. It can be a challenge if you have a community of 60 staff members, as I did. However, there's lots of resources on the internet for team building activities. What I would recommend is that you don't forget to just include eating meals together and doing some playful activities as well as the more focused activities. We generally like to start out an in-service week with having breakfast together on Monday morning, then doing a get to know you activity or a more simple, fun team building activity. Then we go into revisiting the mission and vision of the school and talk about how we want to interact with each other as team members. We invited Kathy Minardi, who's another presenter at the um, workshop in Prague in November, to come and work with our staff a few years ago to come up with a staff charter. It starts with a revisit of the school's mission and then talking to each other and coming up with what our purpose is, and then what our values are going to be that we're going to put in place in our relationships. Then we actually came up with a series of actions and practices 
that put those values into action. Because in a school, sometimes things get stressful. And when things are stressful, people are sometimes not at their best. And we want to have these agreements to reflect upon and rely upon when things get a little bit hard and people step on each other's toes or have uncomfortable interactions with each other. So you're going to develop teams within your whole staff, but you're also going to need to develop a relationship with the teachers as a whole group. This is another thing which is best accomplished in the in-service week before school starts. One of the main things that we talk about is what kind of meetings are we going to have as an all teacher group? Um, how often are we going to meet? What's the format going to be? How are we going to decide upon agenda items? Who's going to run the meetings? Who's going to take notes? And so forth. Um, if teachers have a voice in the preparation for their meetings during the year and their frequency, they're much more likely to be invested and for those meetings to be productive. The same kind of conversations happen with the teachers within each level. In Montessori and Redlands, we had toddler teachers, children's house teachers, and elementary teachers. So I met with each group of teachers as an individual group, and we had the same kind of conversations. How often are we going to meet? How are we going to conduct those meetings? And in each of those groups, the answer to those questions was quite different. But again, if they have a voice in it, they're much more likely to be really involved and invested in those meetings. There's also the smaller team of the teacher and her assistant. Um, during in-service week, I have each teacher and assistant not only work together in the classroom, which is a great way of bonding and building a team when you're preparing the classroom and you're working shoulder by shoulder, but I also give them an opportunity to have a meeting, just the two of them, and then um, meet, um, think about some things separately and contemplate some questions, and then meet together and come up with some understandings. The questions I might ask them to think about and contemplate on their own first before discussing with each other, what am I most looking forward to in the new school year? Is there any aspect of the new school year that causes me anxiety? How often and in what format should we communicate? And how do I prefer to receive feedback? This is a strong um, group of understandings with which to start out the year as that little intimate team. And it really is an intimate relationship of the teacher and the assistant. It's been described as like a dance. But in order for people to dance well together, they have to have certain understandings, right? More teams to build. You as the head of school, as the owner or director, and each of your teachers. This becomes more of a challenge. Um, I like to have each teacher on my staff come up with one or two renewal objectives for themselves for the school year. And I ask that they be big objectives, big goals, some things that really stretch them professionally. I ask them to think through some steps they might take to reach that objective. More importantly, what are sources of support for reaching that objective and how will that person measure his or her progress? Um, after they have come up with those, then we meet together and discuss them. And it's really an important way for the two of us to combine and make a team together in support of the teacher's self-development. So she might very well come up with an objective that requires some support from me. It might also inform the way that I do observations in her classroom during the year. Um, and I have resources that I can oftentimes bring to bear. Team building with um, each teacher does not end on the first day of school and it continues on that first day and in the first month in a number of ways. First of all, I have a friend who's told me that she feels like every head of school should touch the back wall of every classroom every day. Not literally, but at least be in every classroom every day. That's a challenge, isn't it? But it's a very important challenge and I hope you'll take this seriously. This is an informal visit. It's very different from a formal observation. 
Of course, you want it to be not distracting and be respectful of the classroom. It really is just so that you can be seen in every classroom and so that you can be vitally connected and part of the fabric of your community, but also so that you can be continually taking the temperature of your classrooms on a daily basis. Formal observation in the beginning of the school year is a maybe yes, maybe no proposition to me. Um, sometimes a teacher will request it. Sometimes it's a good way to establish a baseline for future comparison. How's the classroom going if you compare an observation in the first month to one in November? There should have been a lot of progress over that time. If you're going to do a formal observation, I think it should be most of the morning and you should be gathering data. So have some means for tracking and determining what each child is doing or um, comparing which children are concentrating, which ones are merely with work, which ones are wandering, etc. And then the meeting with the teacher happens after school and it's mostly a matter of showing her the data you collected and then guiding her in drawing conclusions herself from that data. So it's not a judgment or a critique. And that very first observation in a classroom really can set the tone for all of your conversations for the rest of the year. So be careful about it. Don't make it a critique. Don't make it a judgment. I believe in dropping by informally after school, every classroom, every day. It can be very brief, but how did the day go? Comparing notes about things you talked about the day before. Um, this way, you're always accessible to your teachers and their assistants, and you're day by day by day getting a good sense of how the school year is developing and going. Now, new teachers, if they're new, just out of training, that's what I'm talking about. They have certain characteristics, and so we're going to treat them in a very different way. And it's very important how you interact with a new teacher in the first few weeks of school. They're idealistic, but they lack practical experience. They can be inflexible. They tend to fixate on certain aspects of their training. They may not have established clear routines or expectations, and they tend to be reactive rather than anticipating. They tend to focus on the act of teaching, of just giving lessons, not whether the students are responding and thriving. One friend once described it new teacher fresh out of the training as expecting to go into the classroom and encounter puppies or unicorns or um, ponies in a meadow. Now, we all know that children are wonderful, but we also know that it's hard work and that things don't necessarily come out immediately in the way that a teacher has an image in her mind. So, we're not going to dictate to this new teacher, but we're going to ask questions and we're going to help her to formulate plans. New teachers are not very good at planning. They tend to think, again, that they can just go in the classroom and give lessons and everything will be perfect. What has she planned in terms of snack procedures, lunch procedures, lineup procedures? Has she even thought about any of them? Probably not. So help her think through all those things and also, when is she going to demonstrate those to the children and how is she going to demonstrate? Most trainings will spend at least a day or two on the first day of school, the first week of school, the first month of school. And most trainers have some definite opinions about how you should start the school year. Teachers, new teachers will forget that, but if you encourage them to go back to their notes and look at what their trainer said, you can look at it together and you'll probably find that the trainer suggests things like not having all the materials out right at first, having a transition shelf of things that are not breakable and that are familiar from home, um, maybe having the work period be shorter at the very beginning of the year. Encourage her to talk to her colleagues for ideas of activities and procedures. Also, ask her, talk to her to talk to her colleagues about ideas for group times. Oftentimes, this is where a new teacher will struggle 
And in the beginning of the school year for a new teacher, there are going to be more group times than in any other later time in the school year. So she needs to have some great ideas really ready to hand so she doesn't lose control of her group before she even gets it started. So each day check in with her. How did her plan from yesterday go when it actually was implemented today? How does that inform what she's planning to do tomorrow? Explore multiple options with her in case her first plan doesn't work out, because guess what? It probably won't. What were the results of any lesson that she gave? So again, this gets to the fact that new teachers tend to be in love with just the act of teaching, but not connecting with what are the results of it. And we all know that sometimes you give a lesson to a child and the child concentrates and repeats and so forth. New teachers come out with the expectation that every lesson they give is gonna have that result. It's not gonna work that way. So she needs to be thinking about what was it about that lesson? Did I choose the wrong lesson? Was it the wrong moment? Was it too hard? Was it too easy? How could I have presented it differently? Was I distracted? Make suggestions for any specific situation she's facing. I hope that helps you because you're going to be dealing with new teachers from time to time throughout your career. In general, take it a day at a time, review each outcome and acknowledge each success. All right. The next relationship that we're going to talk about is with parents. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, I won't tell you the child's name, but she's now much older. And her father would always go out of his way to walk all the way across campus with her every morning when she was in toddlers. And this is the sort of hidden parent that's within each parent that really loves their child and wants what's best for them. That's what we have in common with them, right? Parents need orientation. In particular, parents who are new to the school and to Montessori need a good orientation. Orientation is one of the human tendencies. And the better we orient parents, the less anxiety they're going to have and the more open they're going to be to what we have to offer. I like to do a new parent orientation that starts with showing about 10 minutes of this film, Edison's Day. It's very idealized. Montessori home environment. Um, Edison's parents really knew how to design a home environment and prepare it. And it gives us a lot of great talking points. How do you arrange the home to allow access to the tools and activities that the child is going to need? How do you introduce those new activities? I will actually take a few minutes and give a simple Montessori lesson. Parents don't think otherwise that that would be something you might want to do and they tend to just talk and tell children how to do things rather than showing them. The importance of consistency and routine. Refrain from doing for the child things that he or she can do for him or herself. That's an important thing to get across, and most of our parents do way more for their children than their children need. And it's one of the big things that they observe about their child. And when they start in a Montessori classroom is, oh my gosh, my child is much more capable than I thought. Um, there's also practical preparation for the first day. I'm talking about things like um, gradually adjusting the bedtime and the time that the child arises in the morning. So that when the first day of school comes, you're not shaking them to get them awake and to dragging in this tired, exhausted child for their first day who is not going to be very successful. Things like that that are of a practical nature. The importance of all of this is that we're gaining the parents' trust already before their child has even started. I also talk about what to expect on the first day. Here's a cartoon that I enjoy. The parent is saying, whatever you do, don't let him notice our anxiety. So parents are anxious when their child starts in school. And I let them know that I'm going to be checking on their child and calling mom, um, usually about halfway through the morning on the child's first day. The conversation is usually short. And I just kind of say that the, your child is doing fine. Parents don't realize that. They assume because the child was maybe crying when they dropped them off, 
that it's now 1030 and their child is probably still crying. We know that's not true. A child will cry for maybe 30 seconds. I've known parents to cry for a lot longer than that. It's a huge relief to their anxiety. And again, it also is working on that relationship with a new parent and building trust in me and in the school. Largely what we're doing is giving them a parenting roadmap that starts at this new parent orientation and continues throughout the rest of the parent ed education they're going to experience in their Montessori school. Okay, the other part of a new parent orientation is actually the orientation to the school itself. Think about how important these things are. We focus on with the staff and with ourselves, what's our mission and vision? What are our operating principles? Parents also need to know that. And before they even join, they're the most open to understanding and accepting that. What's the history of the school? Almost all schools have an um, inception story that is a story of human sacrifice and hard work and dedication and vision. And it's important for people to know that this school didn't just suddenly appear, that it has a history of all of those things that are um, really compelling for parents to know about. How's the school structured? Is it not-for-profit? Is it solely owned? So we don't give them any false expectations of their role in the school. How are we doing? What are our bragging points? And then what is their involvement? And what are the fundraisers we're going to be doing? What is, what's the parent calendar look like? What are the opportunities they have for parent education during the year? And kind of giving them a sense for their role in this partnership that we're developing. Other parents who need orientation, any parents who are new to a level, and I'll talk about that in a moment, um, but all of the parents need orientation to this school year also. In the US, we usually have what's called a back to school night. And at that night, it's a great opportunity to talk about what kind of improvements we've made on the campus over the summer. Who are the new staff members? Introduce them. What are the things that we're doing this year that are different and that we want to call parents' attention to? What are the fundraisers we're doing? So they already know that when they're going into the school year. It's also a great time if you're a not-for-profit to introduce your board of trustees who otherwise kind of remain shadowy, mysterious figures. But back to parents who are new to a level. Um, I'm talking about parents of children who are moving up from toddlers to children's house but especially from children's house to elementary or from elementary to an adolescent program. And that's because those um, are really great developmental transitions and parents need to be prepared for how their child is changing. So they don't just assume that it's um, some fault of the teacher that their child is presenting themselves differently. Uh, here's an, some talking points for an orientation to lower elementary. They are much more social as elementary, aren't they? So when you observe in an elementary classroom, it's not going to be the quiet, pristine, orderly environment of the primary class that you were used to. It's going to be much noisier. It's going to be much more movement. They're also much messier. Caterpillars to butterflies to caterpillars. In some sense, Babies are like caterpillars. They're kind of wrinkly and they're adorable, but they're not the most attractive things in the world. Um, Five-year-olds, um, by contrast, are butterflies. They're almost perfect, aren't they? And if you're a children's house teacher, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They're right at the cusp of moving on to a new stage of development, but they're really at the peak of that first plane of development. They're very cooperative, they're very self-motivated, they're very self-contained, et cetera, et cetera. But guess what? The next year, as they enter lower elementary, they're back to being caterpillars again. And by this, I mean that their new characteristics um, cause a certain amount of regression, um, both academically and socially. Um, and they also have other characteristics which are not always convenient. It's the dawning of the reasoning mind. So your five-year-old a year ago was just 
fully willing to do um, whatever you asked and was compliant and cooperative. But your elementary child a year later is always asking you why. They really want to know why. But it comes across as sort of rudeness. And actually, Montessori called this the age of rudeness. Their whole focus becomes external. They come home at the end of the day and can tell you what everybody else in the class did, but not what they did. Isn't that a good thing for parents to know going into the year? So they don't start questioning their child the first few weeks of school and then think something's really going wrong because my child has no idea what he did at school today. They start moving away from their parents. So we tell the parents, don't take it personally. It's just developmental. They'll come home and tell you a 30 minute story about a 30 second interaction. You know this is true if you have an elementary child or if you have elementary classes. And as a parent, you'll be convinced this was all that went on at school all day that 30 second interaction where somebody said something like, um, you know, I don't like your shirt or <laughs> whatever it might be. All right, the next relationship we're gonna talk about building is with the children. This is a more obvious one, but I think this is really central and the most important of all. Um, Montessori and Redlands is a big school, 360 students. And I'm getting older, so it became more and more of a challenge for me to remember on the first day of school all of the children's names. So I actually took the time to create a sort of a Facebook ahead of time with their school pictures from the year before, and I worked on memorizing it. And I took pride in being out at the, on the sidewalk, out in the parking lot, every morning, um, at least for the first few weeks of school, and then at least one or two mornings a week for the rest of the school year, greeting every child by name and eventually greeting every parent by name. Um, that way you feel recognized, individuated, and you feel welcomed, and you feel like you're important as a child. I also believe very strongly in going out to recess as often as possible, especially in the beginning weeks of the school year. Um, and I don't just model, although I do model for the staff, what vigilance is all about. It's not about talking to other adults, by the way. But I also model just playing with the children. And that's the best way to build relationships, because if you are going in the classroom to observe, you're really not interacting with children, are you? But on the playground, you're welcome to interact, and they love it. Um, Sometime in a child's career, you may very well need to counsel them. You might need to set a limit for them. <clears throat> it's much easier to do if you established a firm relationship. And again, one where they trust you. Finally, there's your relationship with yourself. And I'm getting near the end of this particular webinar. Your relationship with yourself is built by self-reflection. What are my goals for the year? Just like with the teachers, what are one or two goals for this school year that will really stretch me professionally? But most importantly, what are my renewal objectives for the year and how will I plan and set aside time for them daily? Stephen Covey tells the story of someone walking through woods and coming upon a gentleman who was sawing down a tree working really hard, sweating profusely. And the person asked, so um, how long have you been at this? Oh, for hours. It looks like you're really working hard. Yes, I am. Well, why don't you take a break for a few minutes and sharpen your saw? Won't it go better then? And the gentleman says, no, I can't possibly stop sawing. I've got to keep sawing, keep sawing until I cut this tree down. How often do we stop and think that if we kept our saw, our saw sharp, sorry, um, that everything would go along much more efficiently? And when I'm talking about sharpening your saw, I'm really talking about what are our renewals for within ourselves. And there are different kinds of renewals. There's the physical, getting exercise, getting the right nutrition, learning to manage your own stress, social and emotional. Um, are you working on showing empathy to people? Spiritual, 
Meditation is a really important one, I think. Mental, are you taking time to plan, visualize, read, and write? Are you moving yourself forward? The last thing I'd like to say is that as a teacher myself, I felt like every day when I came in the classroom, I needed to be up for the children. I needed to be open and ready to receive them. I needed to have a smile on my face. And that wasn't always easy. However, I felt like that was my responsibility to the children to get myself to that state at the beginning of the day. Because the children, for them, every day is something new. I think the same responsibility, although even augmented, applies to us as owners or directors or heads of school. So whatever it takes for you to come in in the morning in that state of mind where you're going to be genuinely smiling at people, genuinely excited about seeing the children, and really ready to take on the world in a calm and friendly and open way. Whatever it takes for you to accomplish that, that's your responsibility to do it. And I would suspect that, that that whatever you need to do falls within this realm. So keep that in mind. So, so work on your relationships during these early weeks of the school year. And don't forget to work on your own renewal objectives and have a fantastic school year. Thank you.